Prime Minister Abe is due to announce as soon as today a new package of fiscal reform, stimulus, if you will, for mm -hmm. the Japanese economy. Uh, the headline figure appears to be 25 trillion yen, roughly 230 billion dollars. Um, what do you want to see in this package to believe that it can be effective? So I think um, it's frankly going to be a multi-year uh, package, meaning that it's not all going to be spent in fiscal 2020. Um, it's going to be divided, I think, over a course of, of multiple years. But I think in terms of the content, there are a number of priority areas, I think, given the uh, slew of natural disasters that has hit Japan, not just this year, but last year and the year before, a lot of the spending will actually be quite explicitly directed at bolstering Japan's uh, faltering infrastructure, whether that's roads or, um, for example, we had a lot of flooding of rivers around the Tokyo area, so drainage systems, all of that I think is going to be uh, a primary focus. So I think another potential area, though, is Japan raised its VAT a couple months ago in October. And maybe the government will say, hey, we need to cushion that blow, mitigate that negative uh, impact by doing something for the consumer. Now, exactly what that thing will be, we don't know. But doing something to help uh, boost a consumer spending so as to ensure not a repeat of 2014, where after the VAT uh, was hiked back then, consumption and the economy fell off a cliff. And they are very, very nervous about that happening before the Olympics. Can these measures really stave off a recession and furthermore can japan really afford to borrow more given mm -hmm. that it's mm -hmm. already carrying the world's heaviest debt load very good questions um, we think the answer to the first one is we think it will definitely help reduce that probability of japan entering a recession now if the globe enters a, a full-blown recession maybe that spending won't be sufficient but the way that we're painting the world economy from Goldman Sachs's perspective for next year is it looks like sort of more of the same. In fact, a little bit of acceleration of growth next year. Some of the trade related effects on exports are probably going to be somewhat mitigated. We have fiscal stimulus not just here in Japan, but elsewhere in the developed world. Uh, and we have monetary policy that's going to stay very, very uh, lax and easy. So. Um, Assuming that the fiscal stimulus comes in a timely fashion, assuming the BOJ stays put with zero interest rates, we think that this will be enough to stave off recession. Um, in terms of can they afford it, of course it's going to balloon the already large fiscal deficit that Japan already faces. But frankly, better to do it when rates are zero than when rates are 2 or 3%. And I think that's part of the logic, frankly, is they're looking at the BOJ. Of course, there are a lot of people saying, why don't you do more, why don't you do more? But I think, realistically speaking, there's not much more they can do. So the, the um, leverage of policy is shifting away from monetary to the fiscal lever. On that note, Japan has been at the forefront of policy experimentation, massive fiscal stimulus, mm -hmm. debt monetization, quantitative easing, negative interest rates. Is modern monetary theory the next step? <laughs> Should it be the next step? So that's been quite the buzzword in Japan mm -hmm. over the last couple of years. Um, people, I think, trying to find ways to perhaps rationalize some of these very highly experimental policies that Japan's, um, particularly central bank, has pursued. But at the end of the day, I don't think anybody in this country, at least in the policymaking sphere, is naive enough to believe that, oh, we just create this new, you know, uh, economic concept and major wave a magic wand, it will all disappear, right? We have a lot of debt. The population's aging. Uh, there's not enough people to pay into the system. The expenditures are blowing out of proportion. So something's got to give. So I think the real reality is the governments recognize this as a pragmatic reality. How are we going to deal with this? Frankly, there's no magic wand. It's grow your economy, grow tax revenues, and try to cut expenditures. So, for example, they're now, uh, they've now decided to hike the retirement age, which is going from 65 to 70. Kathy, a lot of the attention, if not all of the attention in this part of the world right now is on Hong Kong and right after that on Taiwan. What about Japan's mm -hmm. geopolitical vulnerabilities? Mm -hmm. I think it's quite real. Um, if we think about a uh, North Korea and that threat, uh, that's very obvious. Uh, I think from a Japan perspective, China's long-term geopolitical ambitions, quite uncertain. Uh, Russia, Japan's still technically at war with Russia. There was never a peace treaty signed. Um, so there's lots of vulnerable hotspots surrounding Japan. And I think this is actually precisely why is the government pursuing some rather uncomfortable structural changes, like getting more women into the workforce, 
like embracing corporate governance Anglo-Saxon style, like um, uh, you know, embracing technology. Before it was like, no, 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 we've got an allergic reaction to this because this is going to mean job losses in the future. Not anymore. I think they're beginning to embrace these things. I'm not saying this is a guarantee for success by any means, but I think they're embracing these reforms because they know they have no other option, right? Because if they want to make themselves a little bit less vulnerable to these geopolitical threats, you've got to have an economy that's not in a coma, but that's breathing and it's actually thriving.